Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Data-Driven Real Estate Podcast, the podcast for real estate professionals dedicated to driving business success using data. I'm your co-host, Aaron Norris. With us, we've got Sean O'Toole up in our Truckee office and with us, Scott Shatford with uh, AirDNA. I'm very excited for this interview. Uh, Scott is the CEO of AirDNA and he's an author, vocal advocate and industry expert in short-term rentals. And he utilizes his 15 plus years in the data data analyst space uh, to empower entrepreneurs to make the most out of short-term rental market. I've used your tool for years, helping investors stay out of trouble. So welcome to the show. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for having me, Sean. Yeah, no, I appreciate you making the time. Your background, uh, data analyst. Uh, tell me what happened after high school. Where'd you go? Uh, after high school, yeah, I went over to University of Arizona. Uh, you know, it was a choice uh, more out of, uh, I went there in the middle of the winter and the pool parties looked really good. So it was, uh, it was a choice made out of, uh, yeah, I don't know if it was academics driving my decisions there, but it ended up being a great school. Got a degree in economics over in Arizona in five and a half years. And then, uh, yeah, I tried to figure out what I was going to do next in my life. But yeah, it was, it, it was uh, yeah, so I went to Arizona and then, you know, like a lot of college kids didn't know what I wanted to do. I uh, had this degree. I had some, uh, um, you know, I, I did work at uh, some hedge funds out in New York City during the summertime. And I was lucky enough to have an uncle that was a hedge fund manager. And so that sort of exposed me to a bit of sort of, you know, how to use data, how to sort of think about it. Um, they were much more complicated quant guys than I would ever be. But, you know, it sort of got me interested on the data side of things. Um, but yeah, I mean, after college, I landed in a, you know, at a consulting company. I mean, they're a recruiting company, really, called the Corn Ferry International. Hmm. Spent nine years there, my formative years, you know, just stuck in Excel as a monkey for about five of those years. And that's sort of where I just honed the craft of how to, you know, create stories, you know, how to articulate things through visualizations, how to be able to communicate to executives through data. Um, so, you know, I, I definitely, yeah, whatever you want to call it, right? I mean, it was, it was a long five years, but very formative in terms of like just how to think about massive amounts of data and how to create stories from it. So how did you, you end up? The, in, go ahead, oh, Sean. I was going to say you were the first guy I met that started kind of hacking Airbnbs, if I remember correctly. We met back in 2015, yeah. And you were renting places as long-term rentals and doing short-term rentals. Is that right? Do I remember correctly? That's that's absolutely right. Yeah. I, um, yeah. I wouldn't say. I mean, I start. I mean, I started the model, but I was definitely one of the first ones that that really realized that there was this you know, what we call now is an arbitrage opportunity is that you could go rent these properties, even as a corporate rental, just being straight up. Like I'm going to have different tenants in here all the time, maybe pay a 10 to 20% premium on that, on that long-term rental, but then furnishing it for 5,000 bucks, turning it on to Airbnb within a week. And then, you know, making a hundred to 300% more than you could as, 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 as a long-term rental per month, right? So the, the real numbers, like in Santa Monica, was I could rent a pr nice property right by the Third Street Promenade, the main tourist district, for about 3000 bucks a month. I would make at least $7,000 every single month on that, on that property with pretty minimal operating expenses. And so it was the early days. It was the Wild West. You know, there, the, these, there wasn't enough supply out there, and all the hotels in Santa Monica were call it 400 bucks a night. And so there was just this huge opportunity for a bigger place with the amenities and the washer and dryer for people staying for a couple of weeks, willing to pay 250 or $300 a night. Um, yeah. And so it was, it was, it was the good days, the golden days, as I call them, <laughs> uh, when you could pretty much just get anything thrown on Airbnb and it would just destroy, like you would just have 98% occupancy. You couldn't mess it up. Uh, but obviously the world's changed. It's much more competitive and expectations from customers are just a lot different than they were back in 2012 to 15. I remember after meeting you, right? Like it was a big epiphany for me and I was on the speaking circuit and I did a whole set of slides basically saying, it was everybody's like, oh, you know, prices have gone up so much. We're at a peak. And basically I did the math to show how prices would likely go up at least 10 to 20% more, um, at least in areas where the Airbnb, you know, model works, where there is demand for that short-term rental. And uh, boy, that was, uh, so that was, it was a good, 
It was a good day when I met you. It made me uh, look pretty smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's nice. You know, we we have a lot of uh, predictions on where the future is going to go, and we get at least half of them right. Is what, is what I always say. <laughs> I get at least half. Uh, but I, yeah, I mean, short term rental is likely. More, yeah, exactly. Just add the word likely, and you're always right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's been a wild ride, you know, like we, we can get to it more, but, um, you know, at that time, you know, there just wasn't enough, there wasn't enough data. There wasn't enough, you know, predictability in like what these properties would do. And so people weren't willing to take, you know, half million, million dollar swings at the plate to sort of hope for the best as a short-term rental. But, you know, you know, now five years later, you know, with 1.5 million properties in the short-term rental market in the U S you know, you can just sort of look at a lot of comps. There's a lot of full-time rental investment properties. It's just a lot easier to triangulate in on like, what does a pro forma look like? What is going to be the revenue in June versus January? And so that's yeah, a lot of what we're doing here is getting people a lot more comfortable about what, what those projections look like as properties of short-term rental. So yeah, huge proliferation. And in these COVID times, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of, there's this whole another demand driver, which is you know, I don't know, people wanted to buy that second home anyways. And, you know, now's the time to do it. And whenever they want to get out of that <clears throat> second home and return to that metropolitan market, you know, they have that investment property to fall back on. So, yeah, we just, we just see a lot of activity in the space right now, I mean, more than we ever have on, you know, buying um, these sort of second homes and traditional vacation rental markets. When did, uh, what year did you open Air DNA? We opened in 2015. So it's yeah, only I think, five years I think, old. Yeah. Yeah. We're just over five years old. Um, yeah. I think Sean might stop by the garage or we met, uh, maybe I was too embarrassed to show him the garage five years ago. So we met at the local, the garage. local watering hole. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. Uh, oh, no. well, yeah. Local watering hole. It was, uh, yeah. Some favorite spot of yours down in Santa Monica. It was pretty gotcha. cool. Yeah. Good food. I, I remember that. And yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. It was nice yeah. hanging outside. I, you know, it feels a little bit like a uh, trucky, you know, on the perfect day in the summer. It seems like it's like that down there all the time. Yeah. It's not a bad spot. Not a bad spot. Um, Are you still there? No, we went to Denver. So we relocated here four years ago now. So, you know, right when we're thinking about scaling this thing and getting out of that garage. Um, yeah. I mean, we're just looking for a lot of, you know, talented developers and LA was a really hard place to find surprisingly, you know, you'd think it was good, but back in the day, not even Snap was, you know, there. And that was sort of one of the companies that really brought tech to LA. Um, but it was hard to find people, uh, reliable people, affordable people. Uh, and so that was one of the big reasons we moved to Denver, just a pool of talent out here was better. And that worked out well? It worked out great so far, yeah. No, it's been great. I mean, we're sort of, uh, we opened up an office in Barcelona, so we're sort of split, you know, about 30, 30 people in Barcelona. About 25 people here in Denver. We've got all the, the techies, the nerds, I say, you know, adoringly to them here and all the salespeople out in Barcelona. Um, but yeah, so it's worked out great. Yeah, Denver's been a great place to land. Not Barcelona, Spain. Barcelona, Spain. Yeah, that's where the other half of the business is. Are you kidding? Yeah. Wow. Well, that's an interesting choice. That must have been a, a lifestyle decision or personal interest decision. Yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely a part of that. Yeah. One of my, you know, co-founders here, early employees is, uh, well, he wasn't a U.S. citizen. So I said, you know, we'll go find a place you want to live and that make sure they have some vacation rental activity there. And um, Barcelona (laughs) was his choice. (laughs) It's a great city. That's that's awesome. Talk a little bit about the genesis of uh, AirDNA and how do you will that to be? Yeah, so we sort of covered the basics. You know, it, it, it is one of those kind of classic founder stories is that I was scaling this rental arbitrage business, going around Santa Monica, convincing landlords to rent me their apartment to put it on Airbnb. Uh, you know, I think there was some regulation, you know, some signs that that was going to happen in Santa Monica. So I started looking, you know, across California, down south in San Diego, maybe up in Napa, Sonoma. I was trying to just think about, you know, I have all this uh well, where, where should I go next? Right. Where do I diversify my portfolio? You know, and I was doing great in Santa Monica, but maybe it's better in Newport beach. Right. Just trying to really understand where I wanted to go next. Um, you know, I had this secret weapon, uh, my father who was a data engineer, you know, who was a engineer and he, you know, I, we talked about sort of, uh, some things I heard about scraping Airbnb. What can we do with the calendars to really understand availability, occupancy, how rates were changing. So I could, 
sort of put that data against some, you know, free Zillow data and just see like, you know, where was the biggest mismatch? You know, where were properties earning a hundred thousand dollars a year where you could buy it for three or $400,000, right? And like, just where did that cap rate make the most sense? Um, and so that's where it sort of started. It was my own purpose. And then, you know, just being the, you know, data dweeb I am just really nerded out on, you know, how do I price more effectively? How, how far in advance are people booking? You know, what could, what's my price on my weekend versus my Tuesdays and Wednesdays? How much should that really be changing? Just none of that data was really available at the time. So, you know, when, uh, when Santa Monica finally made short-term rentals illegal, um, you know, that, that was sort of when I had the light bulb moment. It's like, hey, I've got a lot of friends asking about this information. I've got a lot of people wondering, you know, how the hell I'm doing so well with these properties. And at one point in time, I had the top five one-bedroom properties in all of Los Angeles, and they were in Santa Monica. They were doing like $80,000 a year in revenue. And the people were like, how are you doing that? And I was like, yeah, yeah well, the data, the data is helpful uh, to help me do it, right? And so that was, that was sort of the idea is like, how do you sell the, you know, the, sh the shovels to the gold rush instead of mining for it yourself is, is the analogy a lot of people say. So just giving people the tools uh, to sort of create their own short-term rental businesses. Um, you know, there were a lot then, but you know, now there's three and a half million hosts on Airbnb. You know, we think about three quarters of a million people doing this professionally as a full-time living. Um, so there's a lot of people out there to sort of support in their day-to-day -day decisions and investment decisions as well. Yeah, I mean, I always think that's the best, uh, you know, in, in Silicon Valley, we're always trying to solve other people's problems. And it's so great when you're, you know, build a product that's solving your own problem, which is what happened with me with Property Radar, what happened with you with AirDNA, right? And because you have that kind of real world experience and you know it works and you know, you know, um, yeah, I think that's, that's a really, you know, cool, cool thing. I think most of the best businesses come out of that. It's that a luxury kind of too, though, isn't it? It's just such a luxury because, you know, you don't have to do customer surveys and you don't have to go call a hundred people. You're just like, I know exactly what my pain point is and I'm going to go solve them. It actually yeah. gets way harder as you're thinking about like what new bells and whistles do I need to add? And like, as you get further away from your, you know, your problems of, of past, uh, just sort of make sure you're building the right stuff and solving the right problem. So, you know, it is, a, you know, it's a, it's a luxury too, because you, you can spend years just sort of building the product that you wish was on the market when you, when you have this problem. So. Totally. Yeah. You know, when we met back in 2015, like one of my big, you know, concerns, um, we were looking at, you know, we're working with you to incorporate uh, your data in our product. And, you know, I just, I couldn't get around the fact that I just thought you'd get a, you know, cease and desist letter or somehow, you know, Airbnb would come after you to shut you down or that kind of thing. Right. And it was just like, wow, do I make an investment in this? And obviously you decided to go ahead and make the investment. And that was a very good decision on your part, bad decision on my part. But, um, you know, how has that, how has that been? Is that still a risk for you? Or is that, you know, pretty much, uh, you kind of worked, worked beyond that. You're an important part of the ecosystem now. Well, I think there's a key part of it, right, is, is being a key part of the ecosystem and making sure Airbnb and Verbo and everybody knows, knows that, um, you know, you know, you don't have a whole lot to lose early on. Right. And so you're willing to just throw it out there and sort of see what happens. But, you know, as you mature and as you hire your, your folks and you got a real team in place, you got to sort of shore up some of those risks. Um, and so, you know, we, we do that through having good partnerships with them, through having good dialogue with Airbnb, you know, making sure we're building stuff that's valuable to their end user and is getting people to buy properties and then put them on their platforms. You know, no, you know they're not, they're not going to shut you down if you're, you know, adding another 100,000 properties to their platform on an annual basis, right? There's a lot of value to that, a lot of value to like making people think like professional hospitality individuals, right? Thinking about improving the quality of their properties, pricing them more effectively, having better like customer care. And so, yeah, as long as, as long as you can show that value to them, you sort of become an indispensable part of the industry. And so, we, you know, we, we're thoughtful not to poke the bears as much as we can. Um, but um, yeah, at the end of the day, you know, if you're adding value to them, then, you know, they, they need you and want you and, uh, you know, don't want to shut you down. Uh, you know, as, as people get public and they get big and they're going IPO, you need to be even more cautious uh, about that um, just because the sort of the risk you present to them as a, as a company becomes a lot greater. 
Um, so yeah, it's just, you know, it's a delicate balance that we have to ride is getting enough information to our, our users, you know, without giving too much to regulators or law enforcement people or people trying to shut down and sue people, right? And so we're just very thoughtful about, you know, not, you know, providing or selling our data to people that aren't within our mission and values of sort of uh, growing the short-term rental space and, you know, motivating entrepreneurs around the world to, to dive into this market. That last point's really interesting because like some other people have built some good sized businesses off of things like host compliance and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that would be a, a lot more, uh, you know, combative with, uh, for somebody like an Airbnb versus somebody trying to help them grow their business. Absolutely. Yeah. We feel like we'd be pretty low on the totem pole if they went through that, that process of who do we want to shut down? I mean, there's a lot of people ahead of us now um <laughs> so we, we feel pretty good about that risk but you know scraping always is is risky and you never know if you know there's just a new cfo or a new cto that comes into town and it's like net nah, don't like it and like let's make it difficult on people we don't see lawsuits as being it but we think that you know there are ways that they can make technically make it a little harder just more more uh more just costly really to do it at, the, at this point in time but Anyways, won't get into those details. Won't give them yeah. any, any, any good ideas. <laughs> <laughs> For someone um, not familiar with the product, can we just, can you give us uh, an overview quickly? Because uh, I know we're going to cover a lot more uh, complicated stuff, but just in case they don't know who AirDNA is, can we cover it real quick? Sure. Sure. Yeah. We, see, we see ourselves as, you know, the short-term rental market intelligence tool. And what does that really mean? I don't know if we'll dive into it. I mean, so you know, what we do is we, we cover over 100,000 cities, markets around the world. And, you know, for an average price of 50 bucks a month, you can see all the details, every short-term rental in that market, all the aggregated stats on how much they're earning, how often they're occupied, what does the seasonality in the marketplace look like, uh, how to price those properties. So you can actually onboard it, you know, upload a property and then get recommendations on how to price it on a regular basis. There's also investing tools. So you can sort of look at what are the top performing properties in a particular market. I always like to just tell people, stop thinking so hard, find the best performing properties and buy the one next door and decorate it exactly the same and you're going to be in good shape, right? Um, and so, you know, so like market, you know, market comparison tools, if you're going to go to, Denver, like, should you buy in this zip code or that zip code? How are two bedrooms performing versus three bedrooms? Like just a lot of data on how to price, how to think about investing, how to think about just market research on short-term rental properties. So I think that's the sort of a general gist of, of, of what it is. And once you're up and running, there's all these benchmarking tools. Like, are you performing well or not? And that's really hard to tell for the, in this space is, you know, I'm making $50,000 a year. I'm doing great. Like, oh, the guy next door to you is doing 90. You're doing terrible. And the people didn't know that before we were around, right? Um, and so there's a lot of that sort of benchmarking components as well. One of the things, um, I've got a friend who's got quite a few uh, units and um, he started uh, kind of trying to build his own brand around it. So he's adding like specific amenities, like every unit has a Peloton, every unit has like, you know, some of these other amenities. Are you guys tracking things at that level to say like folks with a Peloton get X dollars more a year or folks with, you know, some other amenity or, you know, bunk beds or bunk rooms, you know, whatever. Sure. Yeah. There's sort of a standard list of amenities on Airbnb and on Vervo. There's probably about like 40 different amenities that you can track. A Peloton's not going to be one of them, but, you know, a jacuzzi would be a good example in Lake Tahoe, right? Like, should I spend $5,000 on a jacuzzi? What's the return on that investment? Are they really making that much more money in the winter time? And so you can do that analysis, not really in our market minder tool, but like, you know, people buy just our raw data to do their own analysis a lot of times. So they can dive deeper into comp sets and think about amenities and think about, you know, building out much more exact uh, estimates and predictions on how much properties would earn. Um, so the, yeah, we have that in the data set, you know, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we know, we know that lots of people, we, we found that like, you know, Hey, there's, there's just some basic stuff, a pool, a jacuzzi in location are really important, right? Like having the lake view or ski in, ski out are really important, but at the end, you know, 
at the end of the day too, vacation rentals, people want to be doing stuff there. They want to have activities and they, we don't really track, you know, pool table or foosball table or, you know, ping pong table or whatever. Like, but those things sell and those things work. Um, but I wouldn't say we have like the perfect stats on, you know, how much your game room is going to earn you. But um, <laughs> it is definitely, people are up in their game now. You can't just have, you know, beds and pillows and a bathroom. Like you got to be having a fire pit and a jacuzzi and like, bags out in the back and like that's really where how people with small investment can get really nice returns on those little investments on properties i was thinking about yeah. why airbnb would would love you to be there is because it helps a lot of amateurs from entering into the ecosystem um and getting into properties that they're going to get buried in <laughs> so <laughs> i i love the feature on the website where you can see the top performing properties just for that seeing the kind of features that they're involved in why recreate the wheel if you know it's what's working in a market um, I had some investors in Florida very interested in Air, Airbnb properties or Verbo. And I was showing them, well, if you're going to do that, you better build it with a pool. There was definitely a set of criteria that if you didn't meet, you were going to make so much less money. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, it has to be super compelling property. You know, it's it's not like how I used to do it. Just like no art on the wall. Just, you know, throw it, throw a Ikea bed up and you're you're in the money, right? It's just so much more competitive now. So all the good people, it's, it's, you know, it's really curated in terms of all your color schemes and your, how do you get cheap, but good looking artwork up? How do you create sort of that experience in these properties? And that's sort of just the name of the game is, you know, not just having a place to sleep, but having something to do while you're there. And, and that's, you know, that's, that's how people are making the big, big bucks these days. It's, uh, you know, group travel is huge, getting 12 people into a, a spot now or getting a big family. It's, you know, that's, that's critical right now. And that's why short-term rentals are being so much better than the hotels. I mean, hotels just can't compete uh, with the short-term rental environment, with the amenities, with being able to cook your own meals, not go out to restaurants, to be able to get your whole extended family into one place for a vacation. Um, I mean, vacation rentals have a super bright future. I mean, especially in a sort of COVID era where everybody's scared of strangers. Uh, you know, there's no check-in, there's no elevators, there's no common space. There's none of that that stuff, which is sort of, you know, scary to people these days. And so that's why you're seeing this, you know, crazy numbers in these traditional vacation rental markets. So like Tahoe's or Myrtle Beach or, you know, Panhandle of, you know, sort of Florida area. I mean, they're putting up numbers they've never put up before, even in this day where, you know, people are scared to get in an airplane or really go anywhere too far away. You know, vacation rentals are holding up really, really well. You know, the cities, different story. You know, nobody wants to own a vacation rental in san francisco right now even that's not really a legal market um yeah the urban markets are are pretty decimated at the moment uh as people are sort of fleeing fleeing the urban centers but you know it looks like it's it's coming back a little bit now it's not as terrible as it was uh you know the last couple of months but it's definitely not the place you want to be right now are you guys doing or working with the reporters or doing any reporting on that kind of stuff or you pretty much just stay focused on helping the investors and stuff because you've got a lot of really interesting data but like kind of like you were saying early right it could be used in ways that are kind of anti short term rental too yeah so yeah we do a ton of research and ton of blog posts and we're in a ton of newspapers and that was a, one of our initial strategies was like how do we get in as many newspapers and you know publications as possible because you know we knew airbnb was a big part of the conversation whether it was disruption to hotels or how it was you know reducing affordable housing or whatever the conversation was and how much merit it had, there was a lot of conversation about it. So we've, yeah, we, we've been in every major publication, <laughs> like literally in the world, like, you know, we've been in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Financial Times all in the last week. And so like, that was a big part of our strategy was how do we become the, the, pr the data provider of record where anybody writing a story on what was happening in the short-term rental space came to us. And now that, you know, now is, you know, a lot of research reports, you know, we work with hotel data companies, sort of merge it all together, compare what's happening across hotels versus vacation rentals. We work with CBRE. Uh, we work with just a bunch of people, yeah, trying to figure out what's what's the new and interesting trend. So, yeah, come to our blog. Uh, we we guys, do work hard on long content there. Awesome. Are you guys tracking the... Uh, corporate use separate from the vacation use at all? You know, there's some new companies popping up there like Zeus Living and others that are trying to really go after, you know, more of the corporate Airbnb. And I think VRBO both have corporate departments too. Yep. Um, 
Are you able to track that separately? Any insights on that? I think it's a, it's a good market. I think it's an interesting market. Um, it's not a market that we, we track particularly well. It, it is complicated in this space where nobody really knows to how to define a, an apartment, a corporate rental. I love the term apart hotel because I get very confused. Is that an apartment or a hotel? Like, I just, should I track it or shouldn't I track that? Uh, and so yeah, there's just so much gray area in what it is. Like we, we try not to think about too much as 30 day plus rental, which we call a sort of a midterm rental, which is what most of these, these Zeus living is, is pretty much all 30 day plus as far as I'm aware. Um, and so I think it's a big market. There's a lot of people raising a lot of money uh, around that and on that space. I think right now that like it's digital nomad movement, this sort of 30 to 90 day rental is probably the fastest growing segment in lodging right now. Um, but to be honest, it's, it's not really the space where my, my data, my algorithms, my partnerships sort of really you know, track that or, or really kind of understand that uh, as much as I do like the three day to 14 day booking sort of marketplace. Yeah. I didn't even know until very recently, like Airbnb and I don't know about VRBO had gotten into that like 30 day minimum, you know, kind of rentals. And, uh, um, you know, I would say it's, it's kind of tempting, right. Go check out a new area before if you're thinking about moving and go do that long-term, uh, stay. So it's definitely an interesting space. Yeah. And a lot of that was out of necessity. Like, you know, nobody was booking one night stays or two night, weekend getaways with their spouse, right? And all they saw was demand for people getting out of San Francisco and going booking something for three months out in Napa or something. And so they knew they had to sort of facilitate like bigger discounts. They had to figure out like how to motivate their host to be like, here's the demand, go over there and like figure out how to price your place appropriately for the only, you know, demand that's on the marketplace right now. The market opportunity is huge though, right? Like how many people don't want to go through the hassle of signing a six month lease, you know, or working for, you know, doing it for work or um, even an annual lease. I, I think there's going to be, there's going to be a big migration to using these, these tools. to like just reduce all of the headaches of like the credit checks and the application processes and everything to sort of get into a property. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I I think there's, furnished yeah. right because the only furnished offerings have always been like these long-term stay hotels and it's just it's just a dreary you know thing to go do you know when yeah. you want to go check out a new area or something and so the airbnbs get really nicely furnished especially in a competitive market so that's where those long-term furnished you know nicely furnished units become pretty interesting anyways yeah. um i just thought that that was an interesting thing i was wondering if what your guys's take on it was um, Aaron, I'm sure you've got a lot. I'll let you get one in here. Okay. Yeah, I got a ton. Before yeah. COVID-19, were you seeing any specific trends as far as the professionalization of the space or COVID-19 has definitely changed some things, but uh, anything in particular, sort of three years run up to COVID, some things that were happening? Yeah, lots of things. I'm sort of thinking about what's most relevant for, for your listeners here. I mean, I think you sort of hit on it, right? Sort of consolidation, professionalization. There was always this sort of thought that there was going to be the brands of short-term rentals, that there had to be a brand that emerges. And so you saw a lot of money money being thrown into companies like Sonder, Lyric, Domeo, Stay Alfred. These are all companies that raised $100 million plus. And they thought that you know, this would be like the new brand that emerges as a short-term rental option of Acasa as another sort of unicorn in the space. You know, I think, you know, COVID has, has put those business models to test and sort of have seen that like, Really, you know, consolidation is hard in this space. You know, having a ten thousand disparate units in disparate locations with you know different cleaning crews, and different furniture and different pool types, and like it just became like too hard to figure out how to do this at scale. And like the most efficient way to run these businesses is with you know a guy with three properties that can go and sort of give them the love and attention they need and, you know, be somebody that's there that had answered the phone calls from people as they check in or check out. And so I think, you know, it's, it's interesting. You know, I think Airbnb is changing their business model to really focus on this small host individual operator instead of like, you know, the behemoths that were sort of emerging running up into the COVID era. So that was definitely one thing that's, you know, it's being tried. And I think three out of the five of those companies I mentioned are, are now out of business or, close to being out of business. 
Um, so that, that's pretty interesting. Uh, what, what, what else? Is, what else? Is interesting? Go ahead. I mean, just I think it's a good, better story for Airbnb too. Like if it's small local hosts, you know, making a living in the community, it's a lot harder to go attack them than you know national companies that have raised a ton of money, right? Totally. Yeah, they were being villainized out there as you know, just taking up all the housing stock and increasing the home prices and you know, really, you know, turning multifamily buildings into hotels that really weren't intended for hotels, but somehow they were sort of able to gain the zoning and permitting and turn them into you know, de facto hotels. And there was a lot of bad press about it for better or worse, whether it was really having any meaningful impact on a city with a population of 10 million to have, you know, a thousand short-term rentals. I think there's, you know, not a whole lot of credence to that mathematically, but um, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a great press coverage for them for sure. Did the hotel lobby eventually come around or <laughs> are they investing in the vacation rental space? Have they changed their tune? It's a good question. Yeah, I think there's definitely that love-hate relationship with the short-term rentals. So, you know, they can't deny that there is this big future where short-term rentals, call it, are 20% of housing supply in the U.S. That's a pretty, pretty good number that it's growing four times faster than the hotels. And Eventually, it will be 50% of the, of, the, of the lodging supply unless it gets regulated out of existence. But, you know, consumers love the product. They love it right now. Uh, and maybe there'll be stockholders of it, too, when Airbnb goes public. Right. Uh, that It'd be pretty hard to sort of rip away that, that income potential from people in, in markets like Lake Tahoe, even though they try their, their hardest in South Lake Tahoe and other markets to make it a real pain in your butt to do it. Um, We've got it going on here in North Lake Tahoe again right now. There's a real push for saying, you know, you can't do short-term rentals more than X days per year. And, you know, the the starting number there is a pretty small number. And, and uh, you know, it's like changing these rules after the fact. And let's talk a little bit about, because I mean, that's one of the biggest controversy areas, right? Is like how this is impacting affordable housing and the rest. And, um, you know, I, do you have big picture thoughts there? Like on is short-term rentals, are they really the core problem? I have my own answer. So, <laughs> you know, it, you know, housing economics is, is very complicated. And so it's really hard to sort of have that sort of two sentences on, on like, you know, what is housing economics? What I can say is in a market like Lake Tahoe, having a bunch of second homes that nobody's at is impacting your housing economics a lot more than uh, people coming in and checking into a short-term rental. The only people people don't like the short-term rentals, the nuisance, the parking, the partying, and like just really like the NIMBY population. That's like, I don't want this in my backyard. I miss my, my gray-haired neighbor. Uh, but that's not really that's not really impacting you know home values. If you think about like I think they just think about that though. Like how many second homes are there in the US? There's seven million. How many of those are occupied for less than 30 days out of the year and sitting vacant? Like a lot, <laughs> you know, a lot. And so if you're not going to let us build more, you're not going to let us build higher, you're not going to let us fill those properties, then something has to give. We have to build more, build higher, or let us populate our empty spaces, right? And I think that's the conversation that has to be had with local planners or, you know, local city councils is you got to give us something here because people want to come and there's nowhere to go. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, these local, they're all looking for somebody to blame and for somebody to pass the bill to, you know, buck to on affordable housing. But at the end of the day, it's it's usually, you know, uh, it's usually a, a problem they've brought on themselves and it would exist with or without short-term rentals, right? Uh, affordable housing, especially in California, has a lot more to do with uh, regulation and lack of building and everybody wanting to close the door behind them. So, you know. That's exactly but, right. Right. You boy, know, is SDR the punching bag of the day. Right. There's, there's just so many things that are going into like, why are home prices going up so much? You know, this is forward investment. It's our, our tax policies. It is a lot of things. It's definitely not short-term rentals, but everybody likes to sort of scapegoat to, 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 to you know, wring their neck. And it's easy to wring the neck of a big tech company these days. It seems like the trend to do, uh, obviously. But, you know, I think when you, when you look at all the different things going on, like that, you know, the, this new asset class of single family homes, right? People buying these up, you know, a million homes are just owned by these, you know, large companies, you know, nobody talks about that. There's probably you know, more homes owned by this sort of 
you know, I don't even know what you really want to, what's the right term, but people just, you know, buying up 150,000 single family homes and then renting them long term. I mean, nobody talks about that, that side of the market, which is controlling a lot of this hundred thousand to three hundred thousand dollar home value right and that's a lot more in this affordable homes you know affordable housing supply stock than it is a million dollar bit like tahoe property aaron's dad and i went back to washington during the crisis and you know tried to get them to free up some of this bank owned inventory to the small local investors and um you know, Fannie, Freddie, et cetera. And it was just incredible when we were in those meetings, like they had no interest in the small local investors, even though they would pay more, like they just wanted to do big deals with big funds, you know, likely so they could go get a job with that fund later and, and pad their resume or, I, you know, I don't even know what the the driver was, but it is, it was, uh, you know, really disappointing. I know we came back from that trip pretty disappointed in the, uh, in that result. And, and of course we saw hundreds of thousands of homes get bought by big institutional players. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, you know, and back to my economics degree in, in college, you know, I feel like these things all work themselves out in a, in a natural market environment, right? Like you'll build more homes, you know, like there's only so many people that want to stay in a short-term rental property and pay a premium on a daily basis. So, you know, when that happens, the hotels will build more and take some of that supply. And like, it's all going to work itself out in a free market environment. And whenever the government steps in and says like, Oh, we're the smartest guy in the room and we're going to sort of, you know, manipulate everything, control housing stock. It always just goes the wrong way. And then like Denver is a great example. They came in sort of put a limit on, you can only rent your primary residence on Airbnb and so what it did is it kicked out every like, you know, local guy with one property. Mm-hmm. And what it did is it brought in Saunders, it brought in Domeo, and they were then like, oh, there's this massive lack of supply in Denver. Yeah, you just kicked out all the average guys out of the market. And now they started, you know, buying, you know, hundreds, uh, more than a thousand properties here by these big institutional investors that could get the right permit, get the right zone, convert the right asset into accommodate that short-term rental supply. So, you know, by trying to, I don't know. You know, it sort of has all of these unintended consequences. You start to go in there and jigger with the system because the smart, connected guy is always going to figure out the way around your your new rules and regulations. Yeah, hundred percent agree with that. The whole unintended consequence thing, right? Like, and uh, the only thing I would add is that we haven't had a free market in housing in <laughs> as long as I have looked at it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I hear you. And that's why, yeah, just my very altruistic, naive self. It's like, why can't you just like let us figure it out? In the short-term rental market, it was the Wild West when I started. And maybe I just, I still dream of those good days when there was no oversight, no regulations, no permits. What advice do you give an investor who's looking at jumping into short-term rentals, right? So, hey, I'm looking at a Tahoe or whatever, and I'm trying to figure out which market to go into. Is there advice you'd give them to give them a better chance of avoiding a, having the rug pulled out from under them? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think, you know, there's a few ways to think about it. And, and Lake Tahoe is, it's, it's a sort of a in-between example because Lake Tahoe seems like it would be a great example of a history of being a tourist destination, both winter and summer, great. Yeah. And like, it's a lifeblood of a lot of the businesses and the restaurants and the, everything that's going on in that market, all the tour operators and, you know, all that stuff. And so that's one of the things that people are typically looking for. Like, how much is this really the lifeblood of our local e- economy? Like, how much is this really impacting all the businesses and the local chamber of commerce? And like, typically people aren't going to pull the rug completely out of that industry because there's such a backlash from every business owner, every main street, you know, operator that, um, you know, they're going to go out of business if you pull that away from them. And so, you know, it used to be in the cities, that was the best opportunity, but just talking about regulation, hey, let's just keep it there. That's typically how we thought about it, but we've, we've just continually been surprised, um, (laughs) to be honest with you. Like it's gotten to a point now, if they haven't done anything draconian at this point in time, it's probably not going to get too terrible. It might put a few more limitations on here and increase your permit fees or increase your tax or something like that, but it's not going to go to an outright ban. And we feel more confident in going into the next year 
that these cities aren't trying to shut down economic activity, right? They're trying to get more people to visit. They're trying to sort of put some more money in the pockets of our local residents. And so there's a much louder voice for let's stimulate the economy and let's not pull the rug out from our local residents. So I do feel like it's a more positive regulatory outcome, you know, in the next 12 months is that, uh, you know, affordable housing conversation is, is pretty moot at the moment. Right. Got to get the economies going. Got to get, yeah, businesses. Uh, moving along again. There's not really a good public resource for it. I mean, I know a lot of these companies have internal sources that like are all tracking all the city council notes. And a lot of people are getting pretty sophisticated about like really understanding, you know, which way the wind's blowing on regulation in every, in every city. Uh, it's not something we specialize in, but there's, there's no doubt in which the key decision, uh, you know, when you're looking at an investment is really understanding where they've been, what the conversations have been locally, where they landed. And if you're in a market, you should get involved, talking to your city council people, donating funds, getting people organized around it. Because if you don't, the hotels will come in and do it for you. <laughs> it won't go your way. Right? <laughs> you think it's probably time for, I mean, I've thought this for a long time, just for the small real estate investors, that it's probably time to like, organize, you know, an association, lobbyist group, like the, uh, I'm a pilot, the, uh, the AOPA for pilots, right, has a really strong lobbyist arm, and we all pay dues every year, and they're always asking for more money, but that's okay, right, like, they really help make sure that airports stay open, but I haven't really seen that for real estate investors, and for short-term uh, rental folks, and that, that feels like that's an opportunity. I know, I would certainly give generously to something like that. Have you ever had those conversations or talked to anybody who's thought about that? Yeah, yeah I talked to I talked to a fair amount of them. Yeah, and it's 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 a tricky one. It's sort of this like I don't know chicken and the egg conversation. It's just like you know how effective can you be, right? And, and this isn't like a industry full of a bunch of multi gazillionaires where you can just go and say, hey. You know, we're going to take a, a nice little uh, fee from you on an annual basis. Like it is, it's, uh, it's 200,000 individuals that are sort of making a little bit of side cash on it. So it's really hard for the individual person to see that they can sort of make a difference. So from a, a lobbying lobbyist perspective, yeah, there's a couple that VRBO and Airbnb have hired to sort of like, you know, take the brunt of that effort on themselves. They have the most to lose. And so, you know, they're willing to spend the most. Uh, what I think what they try to do is motivate it at a very local level because what they found to be impactful is maybe not spending in Washington, but hearing voices of local cleaners, uh, local residents, local business owners, you know, telling their story about, you know, how this is going to impact their, their lives. And so it's more about sort of rallying the local residents into getting and, and just being present and being a part of the conversation. And that's typically what's going to be more successful. Um, and it's almost always in the city level. And uh, we can talk about this for a while, but you know, there we, it's there's been a lot of work in trying to get this done at the state level, right? You know, like so Arizona has state policy. You can't oh you can't regulate short term rentals any any like further than you are a long term rental in terms of like what residents can be there or you know how long you can rent it out as one or the other. Um, and so that's the most effective way to do this because the the problem with city councils is that they they swap out very often. They always have differing reviews and they don't have a lot to do apparently. <laughs> and so, you know, they just sort of waffle back and forth uh, between yes and no, depending on who's in the seat. So state, state legislation, legislation is the way to go. Um, yeah, there's a couple organizations that are actually slipping my mind right now. So uh, maybe we can get back on some notes on who's out there doing this in the moment. Cool. Um, a couple years ago, I was doing a lot of research and I, I stumbled upon uh, a report that said the number one fastest growing trend uh, in the, the experience category was treehouse Airbnbs. <laughs> Is that? Kill it. Yeah, they love it. Honestly, anything funky, put a tent up, put a, like a shipping container in your backyard. Like people love weird. <laughs> like like that, that is like the key. I've got yeah, guys putting up yurts in Joshua tree and just making a killing. Like it is really about how creative you can get and the unique supply. I got a guy dragging old airplanes to sleep in and to in different locations. And just, yeah, you know, there's a bunch of like, people love creative, unique, funky. They love to tell a good story, take a good Instagram photo. Uh, and like, that's really what, what sells, just different and unique. Interesting. Those twig, uh, interleave twig nests. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Crazy yeah, stuff. 
<laughs> I knew somebody in Mexico doing that. He was creating mud huts for Airbnbs. I don't know how it went, but that was his goal. <laughs> <laughs> the mud hut experience sounds wonderful. Uh, now, COVID-19, uh, it seems like a lot more people are staying local. Has any of the metrics changed as far as how long people are wanting to stay? Is it just they're getting away for a week because they're tired of being in L.A.? Yeah. So, so yeah, length of stay has gone up dramatically. Um, so it used to be just shy of four days was sort of the average length of stay across the U.S. That went up to about nine days, depth of COVID, back down to about a week now. But that's a pretty seismic shift for, you know, yeah. you, you know that's that's pretty big. So with that is a lot of people staying 30 days or longer. A lot of these people are, you know, 30 day plus. Yeah, it's a relocation thing. As they're packing their bags, they're getting out of Dodge. So, you know, like, and so people are much more in this nomadic lifestyle now, right now, uh, just getting out of the, the major metropolitan hubs. Um, so that's a big trend. Uh, the other trend is people have no confidence in the future. So people aren't booking Christmas anymore. People aren't booking Thanksgiving. People are going to wait until two to four weeks out to book that just because they don't know what's happening, what's going to be shut down, what, what's going on. So we, and that's the, the hard part is, uh, starting to predict where things are going to be or try to like do revenue management right now. It's just, it's really difficult because it's a lot of people booking for tomorrow and not booking for six to 12 months. That's just pretty unheard of in the moment, which, you know, makes sense. Obviously. Yeah, it makes it's sense, but it's a huge insight that it's gotten that short term. I mean that, um, you know, tomorrow, right? Like everybody yeah. kind of doing last minute. With yeah, that even though, I mean, they're showing that over 50% of our stays are for today or tomorrow. And so that's not like a planned vacation. That's like, uh, I'm on the, I'm in the car and I'm going to go here or I just need to get out of my, my house. Cause my, I don't know, my, my dad's got COVID it. or something, right? I can't go in the house. I'm out. <laughs> yeah. Well, with I've that, had days, I've had days I was ready to go right then. <laughs> <laughs> right. With that being the case, is it impacting the, the per night rate? Uh, since it is so last minute, are you seeing the average uh, stay amount per night change much? Surprisingly not. Uh, actually, average daily rate is up year over year. And we sort of keep like making sure that number's right because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But it is larger properties getting booked. It's higher end properties getting booked. So some of it's just like sort of the, the makeup or distribution of bookings is not going to studios in Tulsa, Oklahoma. You know, it's going to the four bedroom properties and the nicer spots uh, more in the suburbs. So that's sort of driving a little bit. You know, ADR is obviously down in the major metropolitan markets, but I mean, in Lake Tahoe, I didn't look at it, but I, I would be, I would, if it's up, it's probably up 20, 25% year over year, would be my guess. Um, you know, everybody's calendars were empty coming out of COVID. Demand started, came up uh, out of nowhere as soon as lockdowns were removed. And and people, yeah, I've just seen, uh, you know, unheard of demand in these markets. So people are pricing accordingly. But it's all, you know, everything right now is market by market by market. There's not like one, it's hard to find threads these besides every market's different. And so, oh, so go buy your market miner. I didn't even think about that. It was a perfect plug. Go, go buy your data. Perfect plug. Yeah. <laughs> are you seeing, uh, are, are you able to track or see, or do you have any uh, insights on like ADUs is becoming a really hot topic, right? Can discuss so they dwelling units, you know, these, these things that you put in the backyard that are one bedroom, you know, whatever. Is that, is that a thing that's popping up for you at all or? It's the only thing I hear about in California. So yeah, so, yeah. Just it California is a, thing. I've got two startups that I, I know about friends and friends of friends starting that. Um, it's cool. It's a cool business. It's obviously solves a lot of problems, you know, affordable housing is one of them and just getting more housing supply without having to deal with, you know, the governments and the planning folks. Um, so I think it's an interesting, I just, I've only heard about it in California. So I'm sure it's a, it's a, it's a thing there, but I just don't hear about it elsewhere. Wow. Well, interesting. Cause we hear about it a lot here. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, no question. No, that's great that you're not we here. Saw, we see lots of cool business models, lots of purpose built buildings. Like a lot of people are trying to figure out how to get around regulation at the end of the day when it comes to the short term rentals. So a lot of people are building multifamily units with like an attached, like think about like adjoining hotel rooms, but that sort of door that sort of connects and that sort of then qualifies as being a, you know, a attached, you know, unit so that like you can get through all of your Denver regulations. Like it has to be an attached dwelling unit or whatever. And so people are building like purpose built that meets the regulatory uh, letter of the law, uh, uh, but is really just built to Airbnb the property. 
Uh, and so you know, we see lots of people getting creative to try to figure out how to sort of get around you know, the, the silly regulations of all these markets. Just a funny story really quick. Um, last time I was in Denver, I stared at an Airbnb. I went to dinner with Josh Dorkin, oddly enough, of Bigger Pockets, oh. and I lost my key and I ended up having to stay at a hotel. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was in an apartment building that had a doorman and she was asleep. <laughs> so, <laughs> do you see any opportunity because of COVID-19, the conversation about commercial and different property types really struggling um, as small businesses um, go under, you see the interesting opportunity there to go after maybe small hotels or anything like that? Interesting. Um, you know, and I don't know the hotel market entirely well, but I was talking to some of my, my banker friends over at, you know, Bank of America who follow this pretty well. And I was like, when are they going to go to business? When are they going to like, you know, start boarding up their windows? And like, uh, yeah, that's, that's not going to happen for a while. Like there's still, there's, this is going to come back and people got too much invest in these properties to run away from them or think about converting it. Like, what are you going to convert it to right now? You're not going to convert it to, you know, office space or retail space. And so like, there's just not really a whole lot of optionality on it. So I, all I, all I really know is the, the hospitality lodging space. Um, yeah, I don't nothing really like clever is coming to mind at the moment about like what's going to be the new usage of, of commercial real estate. I would say it scared a lot of people away from master lease models and, you know, nobody's really going to take on that risk anymore and, you know, doing what I was doing, but times a thousand, um, you, you can, nobody can predict a black swan event, right? And that's really what it is for, for lodging, you know, no matter how good your, your, uh, your business strategy was, you know, it was just random a lot of your exposure to what COVID sort of presented. Um, but you know, with hotel occupancy being so bad, with so many hotels being built and with, you know, nobody really wants to get into the, you know, studio apartment in whatever, call it downtown Chicago. <laughs> There's enough of that, right? And the, the beauty about the long-term, you know, the short-term rental market is you can convert that to long-term. You can get a tenant in there. It might be under market value, but it's not sitting there vacant. You can't convert hotels to much. Like it is expensive to convert a hotel room. And so they're sort of stuck with that for better or worse, unless they're just going to demolish it and start from, from ground zero. So, um, yeah. Conversion of, uh, RV parks where you take the empty spaces and you put a tiny home on it and, or a park model is what they're called. Right. And, yeah. uh, are you, are you guys seeing, uh, seeing some of that or any other can, you know, interesting conversions of, of property and do a, a, into the, you know, short-term rental space. Oh, there's lots of creative stuff out there. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. There's nothing that this is really coming to mind right now. Um, I think we talked about it a little bit earlier, but I'm not really seeing this conversion of space really. I mean, I just maybe just need to listen a little bit harder, you know, more intently to that, but uh, I'm trying to think. No, not, not really. I think, you know, it's just not it's there. Where it's like, there's just not enough short-term rentals, especially in urban environments where that's where conversion happens. I like guess there's nothing exciting <laughs> about having a, a you know, a, a smaller short-term rental in an urban environment right now. So maybe some of that creativity will come like once it's sort of known, like where, where are prices for retail, for office, for whatever. And like, you know, how does the short-term rental concept work? But I think it's just too early in the, in the cycle to figure out what's going to make sense moving forward. Can you there talk- are going to be some stuff on sale, right? As a result of COVID, there's going to be some commercial and there's going to be some types of properties that are going to be on sale. And if you can get those cheap and convert them, like for our, you know, our audience, right? That's, that's the, the million dollar question. Where is the opportunity in this market to buy something that's out of favor and turn it into something that's in favor? Yep. No, I mean, I think I spend most of my time on the res, res, residential side. And this is one of the biggest shifts that we've seen is, well, there's a couple of things, which is, you know, what was very seasonal markets are becoming less seasonal. And like maybe Palm Springs is a good example. They're putting up the most ridiculous numbers I've ever seen in August. August, July are the best months of the last 12 months for, for that market. And if you've ever been to Palm Springs in August, it's like just walking I live very close by. It's like 120 degrees right now. 
<laughs> right? And so it's doing some of these things like just extending sort of seasonality. It's extending where people are, are living and working from. And so a lot of the metrics that may, you know, didn't, a lot of the markets maybe didn't make sense a while ago is because they were too seasonal or, um, you know, Hamptons, you know, they, they were up 800% in April and May in the Hamptons because everybody was just getting out of New York and it's like, all they knew was the Hamptons, apparently. That's all the place they, they want to go. Uh, <laughs> and so, like, Jersey was you know, off the table. <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't know. So, there's a lot of these kind of cool up and coming markets that are sort of just outside of the city center that are smaller markets, like less than like 50 vacation rentals that are all these sort of like new, thriving, interesting opportunities. Um, so, I think you know, there are just a lot of like fundamental changes in like what's earning money, what's not earning money uh, right now. Um, so, uh, how, how can I be more specific about that opportunity? Uh, and so buy, you know, buying the properties, you know, the thing is most real estate agents don't know any of this stuff. Like if you ask a real estate agent, eh, you know, eh, any of them, like how much can this property get earns a short term rental or like, how do you think the market's sort of moving here? They don't nothing. Right. So if you just know a little bit that like the short term rental market, you know, is, is making 20% more here over the last, you know, 12 months you know, you can sort of figure out where property prices are going to move because I do believe they move in these markets because I have a lot of friends buying properties using my data. A lot of people getting into certain markets like uh, Galveston, Texas is a good example or Pigeon Forge, Tennessee or Destin, Florida. A lot of these markets I had never really heard of before um, that are probably 20, 30% investor owned at this point in time, just because that is um, the returns on short-term rentals are so great. Um, we have a lot of realtor customers who so just, uh, I'll just take a second to say, if you didn't understand what he just said, it's go sign up for AirDNA <laughs> and get an understanding of what's happening with uh, short-term rentals in your market, understand what they rent for and, and what the trends are and all the rest so that you can be smarter than your competitor and close those deals. So thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you for the plug. Um, yeah, I think it's all about differentiation in this market, right? There's a lot of investors, a lot of second home owners coming out. And I, I try to teach these, I teach these agents, I'm not really, but I go to Inman and the, the, the special events say, hey, differentiation is what it's all about. How are you going to become the expert on short-term rentals in your market? Did you know that there's, you know, 4,800 properties in your backyard that are vacation rentals? You know, how do you upsell people that are looking to spend Three hundred thousand dollars. We're like, hey, this is a profit center property. If you buy Lakeside, spend seven hundred thousand, you can qualify for it, and you're not going to pay a dollar uh, for this property. You might make money on that property. So, you know, how do you just sort of facilitate more transactions, get you know, higher value transactions with knowing this data? I just, it's, it's always fascinating to me. But maybe I've just been at it for so long. I'm like, you know, how come you aren't doing this? And it's like, it's just still, it's just still new. It takes time. I'm like, it's. It's been 11 years since Airbnb started. Like, how, do I have to wait another 11 years? Please tell <laughs> yeah. me that. <laughs> What's some of the uh, technology you've been excited about in the space that helps uh, with things like um, noise control or whatnot? Is there anything you're excited about? Yeah, all that home automation stuff is, is awesome. I just, I mean, I just picked up my Tesla yesterday. I've never driven one until yesterday. And I'm like, this is how like the home experience should be, right? You get in, it like knows your name. It says hi, it unlocks things. It gets your refrigerator all ready to go. Like, you know, it puts the thermostat at the right place. It heats up your pool. Like all that sort of home automation stuff is, is super cool. Like just having your entertainment system ready to go. Like just that whole experience I think has become easier. Do you remember walking to a vacation rental with like seven remotes and you're just like, I'm not even going to attempt that experience. Like I'm not even going to try that. Uh, so just like some of those basics, just making it really flawless, you know, Amazon echoes and that sort of just whole ease of walking to a home, knowing the technology I think is always interesting to me, but you know, I'm sort of just a techie, techie nerd. Um, I find two out of four times I get to use uh, Netflix on the uh, previous uh, <laughs> stairs. Totally. And what's wrong with that? I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I had my Netflix account on all 10 of my properties. I think they've maybe limited at some point in time, but like, you know, yeah, who cares? Make it easy on people. And who even remembers their Netflix password? It's always such a pain in the ass. It's so stressful when the kids yeah. are yelling at you, like, where's my show? And you're like, I don't know my password. I can't do it. Uh, so yeah, just making things easy in the home uh, automation is, is, is good. What else is exciting? I guess that noise aware stuff is cool. I mean, I, I know those guys really well. I mean, I think that's interesting. Um, 
Yeah, I'm not, that, does that actually monitor sound levels or is it, I know there's a, I met a gal who has a, a Wi-Fi and she looks for how many Wi-Fi connections like to see if it's above the occupancy limit. And I'm going to forget the name of her company and I feel bad for not plugging her, but. Yeah. Uh, I, I know you're talking about, and I should know it too. Um, yeah, the, sorry. Um, the, there's, there's the noise aware, aware one actually on. has, the noise aware one has sound. It's listening. Yeah, so it's sort of a, you plug it into you know an outlet, and it's sort of just measuring decibel levels. And so if you get above like sort of a sustained a sustained decibel level, it will send you like a text alert or notify you in some way, shape or form. You know, then it's then it's like then what, right? Then you've got to like yell at your your guest at one thirty in the morning, and you know that's a whole nother thing. But at least it's good to know. Cut the um, power. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I think the technology is cool and I think it's, it's even more powerful. I think at the regulatory level, to just talk about all the sophistication you have, how you have your, your party squasher. Is it called party squasher? It might be that, uh, uh, be, that's yeah. the name of one that of those. Familiar. Yeah. And, or noise aware. So it's like, Hey, we have ways to monitor. We have ways to really sort of make sure this is not bothering neighbors. Um, and that's really their sort of strategy is just giving, a you know, local city some more comfort that you have some some technology to control that component. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. There's, there's not a whole lot you can do for getting a home. Like once you get in the home, you know, that, that's sort of what the biggest problem was, just automation of getting in homes. You know, locks, you know, keys are the most yeah. antiquated thing on the planet. And so anything you do to get away from keys and get into digital locks, I mean, that's the, like the first step you got to take in the short-term rental space. Do you have a favorite digital lock now? Don't ask me, I'll get in trouble because they, they all, <laughs> they all, they all like, like to try to talk me into promotion. Uh, there's one here, a remote lock uh, is, a, is a local one, but they're more for pro- you know, big property managers at scale. Um, there's so many of them. I don't really, I can't really tell you a fair, yeah. but there's August lock, the Slag locks are all good. I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, really whatever taps into your PMS. So like look at like Guesty or whatever you're using and just sort of see what integrates because you want that all to be connected, custom codes going out to each new guest without you thinking about it, all that being sort of interconnected. Now on the revenue optimization side, um, are you integrating with some of these uh, platforms? Is that a business for you guys where you're giving them the, you know, these, the guest or the PMS system, the PMS is the right word, right? It is. Yeah. Yeah. Are you, are you supplying them data so that they can like automatically set rates and that kind of thing? We are. Yeah. We have a couple of partnerships like that where um, we'll provide all the pricing for the properties on their platform. Um, one of the bigger ones is with Booking Sync uh, and they're out of LA and they yeah use our pricing algorithm to like, you know, display rates, you know, change rates and push those out um, accordingly. Uh, we're, we're, you know, it's a big part of our strategy is thinking through how we want to approach it. It's just sort of a, you know, there's, there's 70 players that are like PMSs with properties at scale. They're all different places and sophistication and ways of pushing. And it's sort of just a rat's nest of connectivity in the vacation rental space. So we've been sort of like waiting for the dust to settle on some real sort of clear standards and like, you know, what is a rate and do you push pricing and what about the minimum stay and, you know, I didn't really want to lead that whole charge, um, but uh, yeah, we have some partnerships and, and, and revenue management. You know, pricing is the single biggest decision people should be making on a, not a daily basis, maybe, but on a weekly basis, you should be really thinking about what's it looking like, what's your occupancy over the next couple of weeks, couple of months, what's the competition doing? And that's sort of a, a headache, right? Like a lot of people don't want to do that across 10 properties. And so we have enough data, we have enough information to be able to do that automatically for people. Um, I definitely see that as, as, as a big place for investing time. We already have it in market minder. You can see recommended rates are, but you can't go into autopilot mode and just sort of like push it wherever. Um, so that's definitely a big thing we're working on. Especially now with everybody waiting till the very last minute to book. That's, that's a lot of stress. <laughs> it is a lot of stress, right? And the, and the hotels have it really good because they've got, you know, a hundred rooms to get it wrong on. They don't have to get it right. You know, with the vacation rental, it's like, either you're booked or you're not, you screwed it up or you got it perfect, right? There's only one opportunity to get it right. And so it, it is pretty stressful and you want to not be too big of a weenie. I remember being very concerned, you know, we got, I got to get it booked. I'm going to go to $99 a night 
And then it got booked in like five minutes. I'm like, no, I underpriced it. I should have held strong. Like, why, why am I such a, a weakling? I uh, just no confidence. So yeah, it's super hard. Cause you, you can't, you know, you can't really, I don't know. It's just, it's a binary. It's either booked or not. And you don't have yeah. sort of a chance to adjust. Yeah. I've got one more, Aaron. I don't know. If there, were we, uh, were we, we, close we, are, or? we we are at that mark. So go for it. And I've got one last one too. If it, if it's not you that's asking it, so go ahead. Okay. So um, I know big one everybody's talking about right now is Airbnb's filed their S1 to go public. Um, you know, as these companies go public, there typically tends to be even more opportunity, even more stuff that happens. Any, uh, you know, anything there that you're seeing? Did you get friends and family shares? You know, uh, <laughs> I wish. yeah, and I wish. Um, uh, any any comment on that event and what you think and what you think their uh, prospects are? Should we all go out and buy stock? I mean, I like it, but you know, I, I'm Airbnb's biggest poster boy, right? I started there, I made money there, I created a business off the backs of their business, and. You know, so maybe you should find somebody with like a more like tempered view or more like, you know, unbiased view of, of them. But um, I mean, I love it. I mean, obviously, Airbnb was crushed in, in this in this COVID environment. I mean, they had to go raise a bunch of money, two billion dollars at <laughs> terrible terms, which I do think is forcing their hands in some ways to go public maybe before it's perfect. But, you know, if you look at the NASDAQ, it's not a bad time to go public. I mean, the numbers are pretty ridiculous at the, at the moment. Um, so I don't, you know, I think they, they were trying to go in March. Uh, unfortunate they're, you know, a couple months too late to, to do that. Um, I, I, th I see big things for Airbnb. The brand is, is phenomenal around the world. Going public, you know, gets a lot more of your host as shareholders, as people that are more invested in your business. I think... Um, it's such a good consumer brand right now. People are loving the consumer brands. Like if you looked at like the Tesla stock lately, like it doesn't make any sense. And like Airbnb is going to be one of these things where, and people with like millennials with stock portfolios now is through the roof. They got no football to gamble on. They can't gamble on the NBA finals or whatever. And so they all, they're all getting stock portfolios now. And like, what are they going to go invest in? The one thing that they know is Airbnb. So I, I really do feel like there's going to be, you know, this, it's a great consumer brand. There's a lot of young people are going to be investing in it. And you're going to have all these stakeholders that feel like they're, they're responsible for the bottom line, these hosts that are going to go in and, and pile into the, the IPO or, you know, post IPO price. So I mean, right. uh, I, I think I'm, I'm pretty bullish, but you know, take it with a grain of salt. I've been, you know. And just on the opportunity pieces there, I mean, ecosystem's been around for a while now. Is there any spot in the ecosystem, obviously, that, you know, there may be something you're working on that you want to keep to yourself, but something that you think, God, I wish somebody would come in and do this because there's an opportunity here. Good question. Good question. I think, you know, with all of these companies, you know, Airbnb, really, what is it at the end of the day? It's just a brand, it's just, it's just a place to go book a vacation rental. And you don't have to go into Airbnb. And it's just all about Airbnb, I mean, just in this distribution network. There's always room for disruption, right? Like if you look at Expedia or booking.com, these are, you know, tens of billions of dollars of companies, basically just because they're smarter at paying for ads and like getting on the first page of Google search results. So there's always a huge opportunity in being able to just intermediate that stuff, consolidate supply across the three platforms, create a new place to see and view and book properties that are off of these main brands. And so, and you can always charge really good commissions on, on that if you can get it done right. So uh, that's, you know, that's what the big opportunities are is there's no reason this is a three horse race. It's just because why, why is Airbnb unique? The supply is not exclusive to them. It's not like you can't go find that same property in Verbo or book it direct if you go to vacasa.com. And so I'll leave it there. But like, yeah, marketing distribution. Everybody's trying to get away from having to be reliant on Airbnb or be reliant on VRBO. Everybody's looking for independence, just like the hotels don't want to pay 20% to booking.com for a booking. So there'll always be opportunities if you can sell, distribute properties at a cheaper price on the tech Maybe side. Maybe niches too, like waterfront properties or, you know, mountain properties or stream properties or ski in, ski out. Does that, would that mud, work? Mud huts. <laughs> mud huts. <laughs> I sort of like the whole connected trip thing. That's something that Airbnb coined. It's, you know, for 
it's called for the, you know, executive, like, you know, what's your private plan to your Aspen Villa and your experience and your chauffeur and your butler and all that thing. I think there's still a lot of opportunity, maybe not at that like extreme of like, you know, flying to your private Island level, but it's sort of the whole thing booked for you, right? Your experience, experience. travel, yeah. everything in a sort of a package deal without the travel agent involved. Cool. It's interesting you said that the lady that I stayed with at Denver, she moonlighted on the side doing marijuana experiences with an Airbnb. And she also had 50 Jeeps that she rented out as part of the experience with some of her properties. So she had sort of expanded on that concept. So I could see that. Put them, high and put them in a Jeep. Sounds like a great plan. <laughs> Didn't say the same vacation package, but <laughs> what's the uh, last question? What's uh, next for AirDNA? What are you guys working on? Uh, we're looking at crawling out of this COVID hole that we've found ourselves in, as a lot of us are. Um, I mean, we got a lot going on. I think it's all about getting data from people. It's all boring stuff, to be honest with you. It's, it's going to bore the hell out of your listeners. But, uh, you know, there's, there's 11 million properties. We only have access to less than a million of them in terms of source data. So for us, it's all about data as king in this environment. Accuracy is the name of the game. And so just continue to think about how we uh, compel people to give us data so we can sort of always be that record, like data, you know, source of record for the industry. Uh, you know, beyond that, like, what are we looking at? You know, there's good tech challenges. Pricing is always going to be one of them. Um, and really real estate. Real, real estate is where we think that the final frontier is for us is, is um, you know, why isn't every piece of property even you know, thought about or valued uh, in terms of like what the short-term rental value is. So we talked about with residential real estate, you know, properties value is never traded on like a cap rate or it would be with commercial real estate, but why not? Why isn't this sort of the, the, the way that vacation rentals are changing hands? Cause that's what it should be. It's a business, it's predictable revenue. Like you have five years of rent roll. And so like, why isn't that sort of a, a clear or like why isn't that part of a buying process especially for vacation rental properties uh i can sort of go on and on and on but would you think that when people are building real estate uh purpose built with short-term rentals in mind or converting or whatever it is there should always be this component of you know what is the one floor or two floors of short-term rentals we should be building on terms you know, you know below the condos but above the retail and like so that that will be a conversation that's happening with sort of every new piece of you know high rise real estate is like, you know, what is that short term rental component? Um, anyways, I'll start, you know, stop blabbering. I'm going to bring this point, back though. to our, uh, our listeners, right? So real estate investors, hopefully took away from this, that you should be paying attention to the short term rental market, right? If you're on, not looking at that as one avenue of exit on a flip, right? You may be leaving dollars on the table. Uh, realtors, same thing. Like, understand what's going on in your market, you'll be able to better serve uh, customers coming into the market, help them make better decisions. And I would say for our home services companies too, right? Like think about the value ads you can bring. You just heard Scott talk about the fact that, you know, pools, spas, fire pits, outdoor barbecues, right? All those things add value. Those are pretty nice sales, um, for you in the home services space, right? So to be going and finding these folks on the uh, short-term rental side and reaching out to them and explaining it to them in terms of what it will do for their income, right? So if you can look at Scott's site, look at the difference in income that adding that thing will be. And you can then, you can now say, hey, I'm going to sell you an outdoor barbecue. It's going to cost X, but you're going to make Y. That's a whole different pitch than going to buy barbecue. So anyways, lots of good stuff. Um, definitely uh, good, uh, pretty good service and uh, very cool, very cool business. So thanks, Scott, for being with us. Thanks for having me. Good to see you again, Sean. Let's not make it another five years until next time. Thank you for listening to the Data Driven Real Estate Podcast. You can find show notes and links to some of the resources mentioned in the show at datadrivenrealestate.com. Click that join the community and you'll be forwarded to the Property Radar community where you can ask questions about the current show and even see upcoming guests and ask questions there. We'd love to engage with you in the community, so check it out. Please don't forget to like, favorite, subscribe, and share on your favorite platform where you're listening to the show. It helps us out a great deal. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week.